Good evening. We start tonight with a serious appeal. Over the past 12 months in Oldham, Greater Manchester, at least a dozen children have been approached by a teenage rapist. Three of the little girls were sexually assaulted, one was raped. The most recent attack took place on Tuesday, and police are so concerned they now want to launch a national appeal. All the events took place south of Oldham town centre, within a two-mile radius. The first serious case was last August. Three children in Westwood were enticed to a derelict garage off Whittingham Grove. Then in February, and a mile and a half away in Coppice, a slightly older girl was raped. Once again, it was in a derelict garage, this time between Lawn Street and Manly Road. And two days ago, two eight-year-old girls were approached, again in Coppice. They were taken down Napier Street East, down an alleyway opposite St Thomas Street North, and one of them was sexually assaulted. Very distressing for people living in Oldham. D.I. Stan Hughes, how have so many youngsters been persuaded to go off with this person? This young man talks to the young, the young girls about uh, pets, mainly rabbits or puppies, and he coaxes them out of the streets, from the streets, into derelict areas where he commits these offences. Now, we don't want to be alarmist. Thankfully, a crime like this is extremely That's rare, right. but perhaps it is a timely reminder for parents to tell their children. That's right. I would suggest that parents tell their children to make sure that they don't go away. They don't walk off with not just adults, but in this case, teenagers, uh, without first consulting uh, an adult that they know so they, they, they can be safe. Now, what do we know about this person? He himself is very young, isn't he? That's right. He is, he's got the appearance of being about between 14 and 17 years of age. He's Asian. He's an Asian boy. We don't know from which uh, ethnic background he is, but he's Asian. He's um, a slim build. He has uh, black hair swept back a bit. It's very short on the back. He has a thin moustache and a, a goatee beard. Um, on the last occasion, he was seen wearing a white jacket. Uh, on a previous occasion, he had a black bob hat. Uh, on the front of the bob hat was uh, a gold lettering and a capital T at the beginning. He's also been seen on several occasions to wear a checked shirt, blue, dark blue, black and white checked shirt. I think on the last occasion he had some cuts to his hands. That's right. On the last occasion, two days ago, um, both girls say that he had cuts right across his hand. Uh, and these, these cuts were actually bleeding, so it's very recent. Yeah. Now, these crimes were committed, as we said, within a two-mile radius. It's safe to assume that he is a local man? I think he is. He certainly knows the area very well. These areas he's taken the girls into can't be seen from the roads. Either he lives there now or he has lived there. He's been brought up in these areas of Oldham. Um, Oldham, this particular part of Oldham, it's predominantly Asian, uh, and I do feel that the Asian um, people in the area may have a good idea or may come up with some suggestions for us. There is a reward. Of oh, 5,000 It's 5,000 pound reward, and I hope they'll contact Stan us. Hughes, thank, okay, thank you very much indeed. Now, if you can help in any way with these horrific attacks, please call us here in the studio. Or you can contact Bengali and Punjabi-speaking officers in the incident room at Oldham, and they're on 0161 856 8818. That's Manchester. 856-8818. And we're pleased to say that children are now safe from one of the most prolific paedophiles, thanks to Crime Watch viewers. After these images from a video were shown, a number of people recognised Raymond Hodgson in Barrow Inverness. He's now been sentenced to a total of 27 years in jail for a long series of offences against children. Now, a murder in Sussex. Bobby Jones was someone you could hardly miss. He was six foot four and, not surprisingly, was well known in his native town of Hastings. His mother died about five years ago and he lived with family friends. By all accounts, he was fairly popular with young and old alike, but he must have trodden on someone's toes. And maybe you know why. Or if you live on the south coast, perhaps this film will trigger memories of events that took place eight weeks ago. Sussex murder hunt. This report from Alan Rook. The body was left lying face down in the mud and undergrowth. Police have issued this description. He was white, six foot three inches tall, with close cropped hair. He was wearing a sports jacket with a large diamond-shaped umbro motif on the back. An incident room has been set up. 25 officers, many from outside the area, have been drafted in to help with the inquiry. Detectives don't yet know enough to determine... Oh, uh, I know. Is, is that the police? I've just seen on the news about you having found a body in the park. Our Bobby. 
elderly couple. Oh, Bobby Jones, he lives with us. And he, he didn't come back last night. And I haven't heard a word from him all day. Well, I was empty. I just couldn't believe, you know, and I kept saying, no, it's not, it can't be Bobby. But it was Bobby. And I just more or less ran out, crying, got in my car, went to work and broke my heart there. If Bobby was in a bad mood, he would have a sour face. But he used to snap out of it. But then the children used to come up, Bobby, can we play football? Away they went. They was gone. This is the one that's got to go out to Maureen. Right. I don't know where she's going to put it exactly, but she is expecting it. Yes, in the early evening of Tuesday, January the 30th, Bobby was at home, helping Doris with various chores. Run the top. It's loose. Thanks. These boys were also heading out for a family chore. My friend's dad just lives up the road and he needed a tour for his decorating to me and Mark. My friend thought we'd go and take it to him. What about your friend's mixing in? On top in that? Yeah. What, Bobby? Fine, boys. You all right? No, I'm picking on you, no? Nah. What's this? It's not mine. It's all right, it's a mate. Wait a moment. The man with Bobby, he had ginger hair, he was dressed scruffy, he had black jogging bottoms on with white bits of clay or paint over him. Come on. See you later. See ya. Let's go back to my gaff. Where's that, the Crawborough Road? Yeah. Bobby wasn't out for long. By roughly seven, he was back at home. I'm just off to bingo. What are you going to do with yourself tonight? Just popping out for a while. OK. See you later. Bye. This is another part of Hastings about an hour later. I went out just before 8 o'clock that evening to start the service 32 as normal. It's very quiet, as it is on a Tuesday, especially in the winter, nobody about. Shortly before nine o'clock, a friend of Bobby's was making her way home. As we walked down on opposite sides of the road, Bob waved and I waved back, and a little further down the road, he waved again and I waved back, and he was trying to make me laugh. He was a funny person. Hi. How are you doing all right? I'm just home. Yeah. How about you? I'm just going down Alexander Park. Yeah? Yeah, I've got to meet some bloke at nine. This is me. Yeah. Do you want a cup of tea? No, no, I've got to go meet this bloke. Yeah. All right, I'll see you later. Where did Bobby go next, and who was he meeting? On the last trip, I was going down the Bohemia Road past the kebab shop. I saw Bobby standing with two people. I flashed the lights at him. He waved as he normally does in passing. The other two guys just didn't even look at me. I carried on the journey. Half an hour later, and a mile away, in Alexandra Park. Three hours later, and a few hundred yards up the same road, a shift worker was on her way home through the now deserted park. I remember thinking, how odd. Why would two people, one in the front, one in the back, be sitting in a place like that with no lights, nothing? Next morning, Bobby was found lying nearby. He'd been stabbed in the neck. Kate Bentham, have you got anywhere with a motive? Yes, we know that Bobby was a supplier of drugs to friends and acquaintances in all village. He wasn't in it for the money, but for a few days before his death, he'd been talking about making a meet in the park to obtain a supplier. Have people who dealt drugs with him come forward to help with the inquiry? We've spoken to many people who have users of drugs. Uh, but we must remember here that we're investigating a murder. 
and there is a reward of £10,000 for the right information. So I can read between the lines, you're not too interested in small drug deals, you're interested in information, on, on this case, a £10,000 reward. That's right. Now let's look first of all at the, at the, the man who is ginger hair that was seen by the two lads. Each of them ha has done uh, what's called a CD fit. Uh, must be clear, that's of the same person. This is the same um, man as seen by each child. One's in colour, incidentally. He's got ginger hair in, in both. The other one's in black and white. Tell us about him. He's described as between 5 foot 2 and 5 foot 8, uh, medium build, uh, late 20s, early 30s, and with an accent that's uh, not from the area of Hastings, probably from the north. Right, that's in the old London Road that where Bobby lived. Then in Bohemia Road, uh, about two and a half miles away, at 11 o'clock, Two different images. Yes, he was seen by a bus driver standing with uh, two other men. They're both described as uh, late teens, early twenties, um, medium build, between five foot six and five foot eight. The one on the one left has got the red uh, baseball hat. Very distinctive. Up. He's got a red baseball bat, ha a hat turned back to front, and is wearing a grey short sleeve, possibly a, a baseball shirt, which was unusual for that time of the year because it was very cold that night. Bobby must have been driven there, must he? Because that's, as I say, a couple of miles from, from where he lives in, in Orr Village. I expect so. He was seen about uh, 5 or 10 to 11, two and a half miles away, closer to where he lived, and uh, somebody would have given him a lift or he got a taxi or something like that. Do you know anything about that car in the park? Have you got any more information on it, what it was like? That's described as a dark-coloured car with a dark rear spoiler. Uh, it's thought to be a Ford Escort type, a Mark III, possibly an XR3 or an XR3i. All right, well, if you can help eliminate any of those, if you can help identify any of those people, here's our number in the studio. We're live, the lines are free. So are the calls, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the incident room direct, that's on 01 424 456 002. That's Hastings 456 002. There's been some progress on our first reconstruction last month, the Christmas murder, that of Alan Holmes in Camden in North London. He'd been tied up by an intruder on Christmas night and was left to die. Fifty Crime Watch viewers gave new lines of inquiry. Two people have been interviewed, but so far no one has been charged, so that means police still need more information. And incidentally, local businesses have now put up a reward as well. Over in East London, detectives have also made some progress on the murder of Joy Hewer. Her killer set fire to her flat in the middle of a tower block. Police have not traced this man yet, who was seen running from her flat, but they have found the man seen earlier that evening in the lobby. He recognised himself and came forward for elimination. Well, now, a murder that made a lot of news two or three weeks ago. Karen Skipper was found with her hands tied behind her back, submerged in the River Ely in West Cardiff. Karen's two dogs were loyally waiting for her on the riverbank. Now, despite... All the publicity police are still anxious to trace six potential witnesses. Now, I stress, these are witnesses, not suspects. Here's Detective Superintendent Terry Ewington. It's midnight. It's uh, Saturday the 9th of March. It's sort of Mill Road. You've got six people to identify. We've had a marvellous response from the community, Nick, but there are six people that I'm anxious to identify. Mm. Opposite Karen's house at 105 Mill Road, there were th three people talking. There were two men and one woman. Two men were in their 30s, 5 foot 7, dark hair, wearing jeans. The woman was slightly older, long dark hair, and she had a light sweatshirt on. Now, I'm confident that's not Karen. Uh, the, the, the clothing is different. Maybe they were, like Karen, just going out, taking their dog for a walk. There's a lot of people in this area, that's something. There, were a lot, there was a lot of people. It's a Saturday night, and it's 11.30, just after stop tap. Now, what about the other three you wanted other to The other three, find? there was a gentleman walking down Birdie's Lane. He had a rucksack and was wearing a, a, wax, a, a green wax jacket. He, he was walking towards two women. Now, they're quite distinctive. One woman had a pink coat on. It was three-quarter length uh, with ties. Another woman had a, a blue coat with white flashes on the front. And again, that was very distinctive. Now, all of these people probably come from the local community and just haven't seen the local appeals or haven't thought it was important to them. If they don't feel they've seen anything significant, do you still want them to come forward? Well, certainly I do. Karen was a gregarious, outgoing, social type of person. She met a brutal and horrific death. My appeal, Nick, is for people who have any information to please come forward. All right, Terry, thank you very much. Call here now, please, if you can help, 0500 600 600 or the Fairwater Incident Room on 01 22 571 530. That's Cardiff, 571 530. And now to Superintendent David Hatcher. 
with an appeal on a robbery which three suspects were tracked on camera for almost 20 minutes before the crime took place. Do you recognise any of these men in the short cross service station, Hales Owen, West Midlands? It's the afternoon before New Year's Eve, Saturday, December the 30th. Two of the men attacked the manager and dragged him across the store. The men then made off with cash. Here are the three robbers. Do call or identify them. They're all fairly tall, probably in their 20s. They may have driven away in a silver Nissan Micra. Call us here in the studio now or contact the local police on 0121 626 8130. That's Birmingham 626 8130. And now here's another couple of people hanging around for a long time leading up to an offence. This is in Eastbourne in Sussex early last month. They're both in their mid-twenties, slim and around five foot ten. Notice one has dark hair, but the other is slightly fairer, with short cropped hair. Soon after these pictures were recorded, the man on the left went into a nearby building society, produced a gun and demanded money. Please ring and tell us who they are. The local police are on 01323 412 299. That's Eastbourne, 412 299. And now an appeal to Asian communities in Britain. Help find this man who, with an accomplice, committed an almost unspeakable crime. The men could come from anywhere in Britain, but at least one of them knows the Banbury area very well. The rape took place across the borders of Oxfordshire and Warwickshire. It happened last summer, but it's so serious that the police don't want to close down the inquiry until it's solved. Just wait there a moment, I'll come down, all right? Just wait there. Hold on. Here, come on, come in. Come on, my dear, come on. Go sit down. Let's sit down. Let's sit down. Let's sit. What happened? Two men pushed me in their car. They took me here. And then they dumped me. I walked across fields. I climbed over fences. There were horses in a field. And I saw a sign and I knocked on your door. <laughs> Get a blanket. Yes, yes, of course. Have you been sexually assaulted? Oh, <laughs> come on, you're safe now. Come on. Shh. Okay, tell me from when you first left home last night. Um, I left home about six o'clock uh, to go to a friend's house. Um, we'd arranged to go to the Dog and Gun for a drink. We left her house to go to the pub between seven or seven thirty. We sat at the bar talking until eight thirty, when my boyfriend came in. So me and him took a table and talked until it was time to leave. I didn't drink much. It was half a pint of cider. And what time did you leave the dog and gun? No, uh, we all left the dog and gun at 10.30 to walk on to Churchill's. Well, I'd arranged to meet another friend there. I stayed in Churchill's until 1am. <laughs> My boyfriend had to leave at 11.30 because he was up early the next morning for work. Uh, I stayed there until 1am, because I had to be home at 1.30, which is normal for a Thursday. And what happened when you left Churchill's? Well, I didn't notice anything unusual at all in the Dog and Gun or Churchill's. Me and my friends separated to go our separate ways, because we live in opposite directions. You left Churchill's at 1 o'clock. Which direction did you then take? Um, I walked alone along Broad Street. Um, left into George Street, past the post office to Banbury Cross, um, right to North Bar, then left into Warwick Road. I met a friend. Uh, he was coming out of the service station. I walked with him to the telephone kiosk, and then a taxi drove by, and uh, he flagged it down. 
got in and drove off in the direction of the town centre. Uh, continued to walk along Warwick Road and I noticed a car coming towards me from the direction of Kiteton Air Base. Uh, it pulled up alongside me. I continued to walk. I didn't stop. I heard someone get out. I was just thinking he was getting dropped off or something. I heard the car door slam. And moments later, I was grabbed from behind. A strong man had me around the neck. His right arm was around my neck. His left arm was over my mouth. I tried to scream, I tried to pull away, but he was too strong. Uh, he dragged me backwards to the car I'd seen pull up, uh, sho shoved me down, head first on the back seat. I don't know how my legs got in, but I ended up with my head against the door near the driver and my knees tucked up towards my chest. The man got in beside me and told the driver to drive. He gave the driver directions along the way. Straight down now. He knew where he was going. The driver obviously didn't. As we began moving, I lifted my head up to see. But he put his hand on my head and kept pushing me down every time I lifted it up. I was crying and shouting at the man to stop the car and let me out. But he kept saying, shut up or I'll kill you. They told me they had a gun in the boot and that if I didn't shut up, they would shoot me. I honestly thought that if I continued to shout and struggle, that they would kill me. The driver followed directions for about 10 minutes. And then we stopped. I couldn't see anything. All I could see was trees, because it was so dark. The driver got out and came round to the back seat and got in next to me. Me. It's not hard to feel sickened by that crime and, of course, extremely sorry for the girl concerned. Trevor Howie, how, how is the real victim now after that ordeal? Well, obviously, it was a horrendous attack, but fortunately, they are a strong family and they are coming to terms with it. Obviously, they'll never get uh, forget it at all, but um, they're coming to terms with it. Now, let's move on to the attackers. We know that they were Asian. What else do we know? Yes, um, the non driver, he was approximately five feet ten. He's slim build and he had a moustache uh, and quite short, straight, dark hair. And you don't know a great deal about the driver? He was slightly chubbier and slightly smaller, uh, shorter. Now, you do have DNA evidence, don't you? That's absolutely right. We can eliminate people from the inquiry. We need the names. Presumably, well, I don't know whether they would or not, they may have told somebody, they may have bragged about it, perhaps? Well, it's possible. They don't seem to have much respect for people's feelings. It's possible they've mentioned something since this attack, because it is nine months ago. Now, one significant item which was left behind at the crime, which, which fell off the victim, was this locket. Um, fairly undistinguishable gold locket here, but it may, of course, have been left in the car. And you obviously want to hear from anyone who may have seen it. Absolutely. We don't know where that is. What to, um, we haven't released this before. It's quite possible that it may have been given to somebody. Somebody received it quite innocently, or if the car has been sold on, it could have been left in the car and somebody may have found it. Do you think these men have offended before? It's quite possible they have, or they've certainly approached women in similar ways. Women may not have contacted us if, the, if it didn't go as far as the particular scene we've shown. Do they know the area? It's quite possible that one of them at least knows the area, but we don't know the exact location they're from. Trevor Hay, thank you very much indeed. Well, you can reach us here at the studio if you have any information on 0500 600 600. That, as we said before, is a free call. Or you can try the incident room on 01865 266 650. That's Oxford, 266 650. Nick.
Well, it's not much consolation in that case, but a lot of these sex assault cases have led to charges or convictions. And in a case we recently appealed on, a 31-year-old man from Manchester has now been charged with the rape of a schoolgirl in Pontefract. Until the trial, we can't tell you anything more. We can, though, say something about last month's reconstruction featuring the shopper in Milton Keynes who was indecently assaulted after she'd been hijacked in her car. As we turned into the woods, I, I knew that he'd got me where he wanted to. Over 400 viewers rang, and many put names and addresses to this EFIT, and the detectives say they are now very hopeful of a successful outcome. One of the most heartrending moments last month was when we talked to the sister of Peter Swales. She, you may remember, with her husband and Peter, had stopped on a country road near Pontefract to talk to a driver behind who they thought had been flashing his lights at them. A few moments later, the near side window of their car was smashed and Peter died from blows to the head. One thing that emerged because of the programme is that a wristwatch recovered from the scene was probably worn by the killer. This is it. It's an Avia watch. It's well worn and it was sold actually with a black strap. This one you see here is a replacement. There's also been progress on the murder weapon, which may be an Indian club, rather like this, although the colour may be lighter than this one here. So here's an e-fit of the killer, and here's his car, a maestro, we believe, who looks like this, with a car like that, owned something like that wooden club, but has lost an Avia watch. Call us 0500 600 600, or call the Yorkshire Police in Wakefield on 01924 239, sorry, 293 305. That's Wakefield 293 305. And now here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames. First, we need your help to find a man wanted all over the country for a string of deceptions. Raymond John Amos is in his mid-40s, shortish, stocky and with dark receding hair. He has a south-east of England accent and what's said to be a peculiar finger on his left hand. He, or somebody remarkably like him, has a favourite trick. Arriving at a business, asking for a member of staff he knows is absent. He says he's delivering a television and that he can supply things very cheaply. People believe him and hand him money. Hand him over if you can. 0500 600 600 or you can call officers in Bristol on 0117 945 5055. That's Bristol 945 5055. Now to these two, also wanted for deception. They paid across a stolen cheque that had been doctored. Here they are in South London at the Crystal Palace Parade branch of the Woolwich. If you know who they are, do give us a call straight away. Here's the free call number once again, 0500 600 600, or you can call officers direct on 0181 284 5059. That's 0181 284 5059. Let me tell you a bit about the calls that have been coming in. Firstly, the child sex attacks in Oldham. Yeah. One further victim has now been identified, has come forward as a result of the programme. Somebody has said uh, that they're pretty sure that they can give important information. The detectives are quite interested in that. And three new names have uh, been put forward for the inquiry. The two men sitting on a bench prior to the robbery in uh, Eastbourne, one name has come up three times on that. On the Bobby Jones case, several names being put forward, especially for the man with the ginger hair, and one person says and is pretty confident that they can identify him through family connections. And incidentally, a bit more news from last month, someone posing as a church official drew a large amount of cash from a bank in South London. You might recall that. As a direct result of information given by a viewer, a man has been arrested and charged with two counts of deception. Now here's Superintendent David Hatcher again. This is a strange case. We think it's a bank robbery that turned into an opportunist theft. This is Lloyd's Bank in Hemel Hempstead, Hertfordshire. Notice the man queuing at the left. His hand is always in his pocket. Now look at what he's seen. The customer on the right is putting down his savings as a deposit on a house. There's over £4,000. Suddenly the young man grabs the bag and flees. The victim gave chase and after a struggle pursued the thief to a rather tatty blue Ford Orion. The engine was running but there was no one driving. Instead there was a lad of 13 or 14 waiting in the passenger seat. The thief jumped into the car and fled. Who is he? Please ring. The number to call is 01442 271 043. That's Hemel Hempstead 271 043. 
This coming Saturday, it would have been Deborah Wood's 21st birthday. Why she's not alive to celebrate is a mystery that we hope tonight someone will solve. Debbie, who lived in Holbeck in Leeds, disappeared late one afternoon in early January and nothing more was heard of her for well over a week. So you say Officers were first alerted at 4.30 this morning when a resident reported a fire. Police found the burning body of a young girl, aged, they believe, between 15 and 25. Debbie was brought up in Morley, to the south of Leeds, but her parents separated when she was a child. She started drinking in her teens and found it hard to keep a job. But she stayed in Leeds and kept in contact with both parents. Once a week, she met her mum to visit charity shops in Morley. Anyway, I'm nearly 21, you know. Mm. Staying at my mate's house for Christmas dinner. Oh, that's good. I tell you what, though, I could really do with some new winter clothes. It's absolutely freezing in that flat. Oh, well, we'll have to see what we can do, <laughs> won't we? Hey, I like that. Yeah? You think it's my colour? Yeah, do you like it? Right. Come on then, let's try it on. Oh, they're nice. Ah, we we'll try them on. They're a bit expensive. Oh, don't worry. It's Christmas. I'll treat you. Oh, thanks, Mum. Yeah. What do you think? Ah, it suits you. It really suits you. Yeah. Are you happy with that for your Christmas? Yeah. That'll be six forty nine, love, please. Oh, thanks, Mum. Thanks very much. When she last school, she got a job. And then she, she managed to get a place of her own. She just chuffed about it. She'd come and go when she wanted. I think she knew quite a lot of people, you know. But she's like me. She'll, um, if, she, if she stood at a bus stop and she'll just talk to anyone, you know, to get friendly with them. Now, police need to trace all Debbie's friends, including two who went to her bedsit in Holbeck shortly before Christmas. I went downstairs to see who was at the door and I saw two men. One I think is called Gary. Debbie in? No. He was about five feet eight and a half inches tall, had hair that was cropped in the sides and longer and oiled in the top. He was wearing a dark jacket. I would say he was about early to mid-twenties in age. So who are these two? Hey, Debbie, they'll just put this in there. Ta, put them in. Yeah. I need uh, Lou Roll. Yeah. Debbie's father met her on the day she disappeared. They went shopping in her local supermarket. He lived nearby. Soft stuff. Just put it in. Well, it's your money. Yes. Can you do me a favour? Can you drop this stuff off at my flat? Yeah. And I'll see you after. Sure. Is that all right? No problem, love. Leave it with me. Late that morning, Debbie met her father once again in Big Lil's bar in central Leeds. Oh, I wondered how everybody was. Hey, Joe, cheers already for that, then. Hey, by the way, how's your mum? She's all right. I saw her the other day. I like your new gear. Yeah, I got it for Christmas. Can I have a light? Your mum get you that? Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Hey, you look smart. Hello, mum. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Listen, I haven't got much money. Can you make me an appointment at the housing office for Thursday? Yeah. OK, I'll see you outside the town hall about ten. OK, see you then. At five o'clock, Debbie left the pub and headed off. But where did she go? She certainly never went home. On my way to, I went about two hours, I kept, I kept walking round, and then I, I came home then. And uh, I thought, well, if she rung me up, I'd tell her off, like, for not meeting me. But I couldn't understand, because when we make arrangements to meet anyway, she always turns up. I was driving down Cardigan Road, going into town to meet some friends. I saw this figure of a man over this person on the floor as if he's trying to pick him up 
I, I just thought that it was two mates fighting, you see. So I didn't want to get involved, so I just keep on going. Three and a half hours later, and less than 150 yards away. As I walked down Chapel Lane, I could smell what smelled like a bonfire, and I could hear crackling noises. And as I turned the bend, I could see the fire, and I realised that I should phone the fire brigade. The next day, I saw it on the television. They found a, a decomposed body, badly burnt, down Burley Railway Station. I know I bought them clothes, and it just fits. What little bits, what, what they found on a body. But I just rung up one morning. Told them that that's my daughter. Well, Detective Superintendent Andy Brown, Debbie's body was set alight. What does that tell us about her killer? It's probably the act of a desperate man, um, an attempt to try and conceal her identity or at least try, try and get rid of the, uh, the evidence that might have connected him to the, to the murder. It did delay us uh, identifying Debbie's body and um, we have had difficulties since with some of the problems. Now, she was last seen on the evening of the 4th of January. Her body was found on the 14th. When do you believe she may have been killed? We think she actually um, was killed shortly after she left Big Lil's pub in the city centre of Leeds. Um, and then there we have this 10-day gap where someone's either kept her in storage or has known where she's been. And then something has prompted that person to actually take her to the railway station and set a light to her body. It is difficult, isn't it, in 10 days to hide a body from anyone else, really? Yes, it is, but it, it depends where it's been kept. And we don't know what the reason uh, was for actually uh, setting it on fire on the 14th. So it's vital, really vitally important, that you trace Debbie's movements on the 4th of January after she left Big Lil's pub? The, the, the important thing is we, we don't know why she was in the Burley area. Um, it may well be that it's the murderers from the Bur Burley area and that's, uh, that's why she's ended up in that, in that area. We have not found any friends or any pubs that she's visited. Uh, it's a mystery why she's, she's actually ended up uh, in Burley. Now, the person that we saw in that reconstruction, a so-called friend called Gary, you've traced a lot of her friends, but you haven't managed to trace him. We've traced a large amount of friends, but uh, Gary's someone that was obviously on the scene um, around Christmas time, so we are interested in him. He hasn't come forward. We know that he went to a home uh, in Beverly Terrace. He went with another man on one occasion. We haven't traced Gary. I want him to come forward or someone to tell us who he is. Another significant sighting, again, the, the one we saw in the film, was the person bending over what appeared to be a body or certainly a figure in the Burley area shortly before the fire was found. It was only a few hours before, and, uh, I mean, the worst scenario was that it was actually someone dragging Debbie's body to the railway station, which, again, would... Uh, lead us to think that the killer is from the Burley area. There may be an innocent explanation. Uh, and if there is, then we need someone to come forward and give us that explanation. Andy Brown, thank you very much indeed. Well, as always, do call us here if you can help. It's vitally important that we catch this person. Remember, it is a free call number. Or if the numbers here are busy, as they are at the moment, try the incident room in Leeds. That's a free phone, and that's 0800 318 001. That's 0800 318 001. And now here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames again. Two years ago, Jaswinder Singh Rana left his wife and children and moved away. About three weeks ago, his wife and her friend were attacked with a knife like a machete. Both are now critically ill in hospital and it's been treated as an attempted murder. Mr Rana is wanted for questioning, but please don't approach him, do call us. He drives a light green Datsun Sunny, registration number ALK318Y. You might like to take a note of that, that's ALK318Y. Shortly after the attack, he was seen in the Trowbridge and Chippenham areas of Wiltshire. The incident room is in Rochester in Kent on 01634 884422. That's 01634 884422. Well, to tell you about the call so far, the problem now is where to start. There's so much coming in. Bobby Jones, the murder there, the same name has come in twice uh, for the ginger-haired man. There were two CD fits, as they called of him. These are the two... Uh, witnesses 
It's the same man, and it looks like uh, we've got a very strong name for him. Same names uh, have come in, too, for uh, uh, two other men who were seen much later that evening on the Deborah Wood murder. Again, new names have been suggested. The Eastbourne armed robber, two men on a bench. Frankly, that's very strong identification there indeed. Banbury rape, a prison officer thinks he might know more there about uh, who one of those assailants was. So it goes on. On the Peter Swales... Uh, uh, murder incident, the man killed in a car. Uh, someone there is convinced he knows who the killer is. More names are duplicating on other cases too. Now to one of the favourite features of this programme, and with targeted police initiatives like Operation Bumblebee, the need for it is growing all the time. With successful drives against burglars, more and more property is being recovered. But who owns it? Here's Eric Knowles. Well, there's no shortage of furniture on the cave this evening, starting with this early 19th century gentleman's shaving stand, complete with mirror, tray and this little drum table with a little lift-up lid. However, should you prefer the age of walnut, what about this little treasure? It's marquetry, it's possibly Dutch, it's a little miniature chest, or is it? Because by lifting the lid, all is revealed. Six lovely decanters, beautifully detailed in gilt, Alas, there's only one little wine glass left. Bit of a shortage there. But there's no shortage of deer in this oil painting. It's behind glass, it is framed, and uh, it's a lovely composition. And I think I can see in the distance the dreaming spires of Oxford. However, should your line be more cats, then what about this Louis Wayne pencil drawing? Now, it has been reframed, and it does bear a gallery label on the reverse. As for the verse itself, well, the subject there is money. And I'll tell you, you'll need a bit of money if you want to buy a gold and diamond bracelet like this one. Now, the police do believe that this object has been stolen within the last four or six months, so do pay careful attention there. And next to it, what about this piece of Russian silver? Niello, that is, inlaid in black, a lovely little Russian silver snuff box. From a snuff box to a work box. And here's a piece of typical Victoriana, lovely figured walnut, and um, here's a nice little surprise. Lid falls down, and there you've got a nice little writing slope. Now, that has been re-leathered again quite recently. But should you prefer furniture of quite some size, what about this for a chest? It's Dutch, it's 19th century, and that is what I call a rather busy piece of furniture. However, should you prefer the more simple Georgian classical lines, then you can't beat a wine cooler. And this example contains its original casters, and look at this lovely uh, lion mask and ring handle. Now it opens, and what's inside? Well, that's the sad news. I'm afraid it's completely empty, and I can tell you now, that is criminal. Well, it is almost time for our melted milk now, anyway. Now, if you can help in any way trace these items, here's the studio number, or call 01424 425 000. That's 01424 425 000. If you've lost something in a burglary and you haven't seen it in Aladdin's cave, you might like to know about the next Operation Bumblebee Roadshow. It's part of the campaign against burglaries with property recovered by the police. The display will be in the southeast of England at Bromley Civic Centre in Kent, and it's on the weekend of the 13th and the 14th of April. And that's all for this month, except to say the lines are open until midnight. There's scarcely one free at the moment, but please do persevere. If you've any information on a crime we haven't covered, We'll try Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 555 1. 0800 555 1. We're back with Crime Watch Update at 11.45. I know it's late, but we hope to have some more developments by then. Meanwhile, however you interpret this week's latest crime statistics, the tide of rising crime really does seem to have been halted, partly with your help. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Welcome back. 
First, the series of assaults on children in Oldham in Lancashire, including the rape of a 13-year-old. There's been a development tonight which means that for legal reasons we can't go into any details of any of the calls that we've had. On the murder of Deborah Wood in Leeds, four people have given the same name. On the murder of Bobby Jones in Hastings, a remarkable combination of circumstances has been drawn together by a single call that might transform the inquiry. There's lots more too. Let's start with the rape that began in Banbury in Oxfordshire. Well, yes, this happened a long time ago, last June, in fact, and it uh, started with a dreadful abduction. A young woman walking home from a disco was bundled by two men into a passing car. Straight down now. Well, Trevor Howie, have you been encouraged by the response this evening? Tremendously encouraged, yes. We've had numerous phone calls. Um, in particular, we've had quite a few phone calls from ladies who have been approached in similar circumstances, not raped, but uh, have not uh, previously reported it to us. We will obviously follow all those up. In addition to that, we've had several names come into the picture and we will follow those up as well. Now, all we know about them is that they were two Asian men, weren't they? That's right, yes. Um, the non-driver, uh, he was about five feet ten, very slim build, obviously dark hair, which was cut short, and he had a moustache. And the other one was... Uh, stockier build, quite muscular. Now, briefly, a locket would have been left behind somewhere at the scene, either in the car or nearby, because the victim was actually wearing this at the time, but uh, it's since gone missing, hasn't it? That's right, yes. Um, it's absolutely vital if anybody has found a locket similar to that uh, that they called us. And uh, briefly, I think there is quite a reward, £5,000 in true, this yes. case. Thanks very much indeed. And now to Superintendent David Hatcher. Yes, first that case on in Hales Owen at the uh, service station. Well, we've had a small number of calls, but in fact we've had names for two of those particular offenders. One of them, uh, we've got the same name rung in twice. Moving now to Eastbourne and the attempted armed robbery there, well, we've had the same name for one of those guys 15 times here and at the incident room. We still need suggestions as to the guy with the dark glasses, so if you know who he is, please call. And then lastly, Hemel Hempstead, 20 calls, three calls have given us the same name there, and we know exactly where he is. So officers are very optimistic that we've got a result on all those cases. One case that we featured tonight has had such huge national publicity already that perhaps uh, it's not surprising we've had so little response tonight. Karen Skipper was found with her hands bound behind her back in the River Ely in Cardiff. Now, Detective Superintendent Ewington, perhaps it's not so disappointing and so surprising. We've had so few calls when one thinks you were only really trying to reach six people. Yes, it is disappointing from the response tonight, but yes, I would emphasise it's only six people that we're trying to trace within a, an area of 600 yards. That's the, only, that's the distance that Karen walked. There were three people up in Mill Road, this if you is, remember. Uh, th this is Saturday the 9th of March. It's midnight. Midnight, Saturday night, 9th of March, there were three people up in Mill Road, two men and a woman, talking together opposite Karen's house. There was a man walking with a rucksack, wearing a green wax jacket, walking down Birdie's Lane. Two women on the footbridge itself with distinctive coats, the pink three-quarter length coat and the blue coat with the, with the white flashes, on the footbridge itself alongside Birdie Field. And these are all residents of the Ely Fairwater Estates, you're yes, pretty sure? Yes, it's, it's a walkway between Fairwater and Ely itself. All right, well, if that was you, please do, even at this stage, call us now. <coughs> Excuse me, Raymond John Amos is wanted for a string of deceptions right across the country, and as a result, nearly 20 people have rung in, quite a number from other possible victims, so that may well help. We, we still need to find him now, so call if you know where he is. And Jaswinder Singh Rana, we wanted to speak to him about the attempted murder of his ex-wife and her friend. Although we've only had ten calls, they are still coming in. Several sightings of that car he had, the Datsun Sunny, and one is particularly interesting as it ties in with another caller who says they know where he works. So some progress there, but if you know where he is, please ring. Bobby Jones lived in Hastings on the south coast and he was fairly well known in the area if only because he was exceptionally tall. On Tuesday evening at the end of January, he told friends that he was meeting someone in a local park. Yeah. Do you want a cup of tea? No, no, I've got to go and meet this bloke. Yeah. See you later. Bobby, it seems, kept that appointment. Whatever happened, he was killed. He was stabbed in the neck. Kit Bentham, when I spoke to you about 20 minutes ago, um, 
You were looking fairly confident. You'd had quite a large volume of calls, but nothing spectacular. Then about, what now, 10, 12 minutes ago, you sort of lit up like lit neon. We've had an, a number of suggestions about each of the, the, the people we did CD fits for, but one in particular draws together the ginger-haired man seen at 6.30 in All Village with the man in the red baseball cap seen at 11 p.m. in uh, Bohemia Road in Hastings, but also with the vehicle, with the car, which was parked only 50 yards from the murder scene. Now, for people who didn't see the original programme earlier tonight, the significance is that these were really quite separate appeals, albeit on the same case. The ginger-haired man was seen at about 6.30 in the evening in one part of Hastings. That's right. On the old London Road. The next sighting was completely different by a bus driver, and that was of two men seen about 11 o'clock. And that was shortly before he went into the park. And then the car was seen again separately some two hours later, two and a half hours later, in the park. Mm, that's right. So have you got name? Have you got addresses? Have you got real details? We've got sufficient to information to find out who they are. So it's looking very strong yes, indeed. Yes, Good. Thanks very much indeed. Well, we've also had a lot of calls on the murder of 20-year-old Deborah Wood. Now, she disappeared from Leeds in early January. Deborah lived alone in Beverly Terrace, Holbeck, and we appealed for two friends who'd gone to visit her two weeks before she disappeared. A month later, a passerby discovered a fire under a railway bridge, while Debbie's body was found by the fire crew. Detective Superintendent Andy Brown, one of those friends you wanted to trace we believed was called Gary, and I think from the phone calls you've had tonight, there there are an awful lot of Garys in Leeds. Yes, it's, it, it's the link with the ether, of course, that we're looking for. Most of the calls that we've received at Leeds and in the studio have uh, given us suggestions about Gary. We are particularly interested in one man, because four separate people have actually named this individual, so uh, we're excited about that. We're, we've also had a call from a, a man who, who's given us a, another name, Gary, and, st and said that uh, this Gary was a, a boyfriend of Deborah's, um, but he didn't give us his name. We'd urge him to call us back. We'd need to speak to him. Um, a man, what's believed to be a man, was seen stooping over a figure or a person near to where the body was found, but no one's come forward on that yet. No one's come forward, and um, that perhaps makes it more suspicious. Probably was the, the, the murderer taking Debbie's body to the railway station. Okay, but still very encouraging on the Garys. Yes. Andy Brown, thank you. Well, let's get us something rather less grim now. Indeed, uh, a chance to recover something from a crime, and let's catch up on Aladdin's cave. Here's Eric Knowles. Well, a few callers have um, got in touch to say that this has appeared on another programme very close to my heart, namely the Antiques Roadshow. Uh, but I think the chances of that are rather slim. However, we will be talking to the Roadshow tomorrow just to cover that one. Uh, but the police are very, very um, keen to, for you to have another look at this bracelet. It's contemporary, in other words, it's relatively modern, and, um, and what's more, gold and diamonds, and they're pretty certain that this has gone missing only in the last four or five months. Uh, we've had a couple of people uh, pretty certain that they own this lovely little uh, Russian silver snuff box, so uh, things are looking good there. Uh, but one or two people, again, want to have a look at something I didn't actually talk about, and here it is, uh, a little carriage clock, uh, it's in, uh, uh, in, in gilt metal and it's very well detailed, so have a close look, but um, I'm afraid you haven't got much time because, of course, uh, time is always of the essence when it comes to the Aladdin's cave. Well, our lines are closing now. She says time is of the essence, but you'll see local numbers in a moment and you can find them all on CFAX on page 614. Alternatively, on these or any other crime, you can always try ringing Crime Stoppers. They're probably on answer phones now. They're on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. That's 0800 treble 5 treble 1. We'll be back at our usual time, our new usual time, that is, of 10 o'clock on Thursday, the 25th of April. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.